Please stand and worship with us.
Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we can come together as a body of believers and just glorify you uh, through worship. I pray that you would uh, bless this community, bless these people, and I pray that we'd have a great rest of the day. Amen. Good morning. Um, so I would just like to introduce Jeremy Lewis, but before he comes up, I just want to give you some encouragement to just really be intentional and not just go through the motions this morning, but really listen to what God has to say to you, because I guarantee you there's something that he wants to tell all of us this morning if we would just be willing to listen and just really push into his word. So yeah, welcome Jeremy Lewis. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, I guess I'm on. There we go. Awesome. Hey, my name's Jeremy. As uh, Annalise said, I am the student pastor over at Central Church in College Station. Uh, it's been a little while since I've been here for chapel, but I'm glad to be back and hang out with you guys this morning. Now, let's just be honest. It's Tuesday morning. It is 8.09. You've just had a three-day weekend, and we're in a Christian school. So this is the highlight of your year right now, right? You're like, this is the, the pinnacle of moment. You know, forget Sadie, forget prom, forget homecoming, forget football. This is it, right? Chapel on Tuesday morning. So I understand that you are like, okay, let's just get through this. I've got a quiz. Can I study while he's talking? Okay. But as Annalise just said, I truly believe that anytime we open the word of God, he has something for us to hear. Literally, as I prepared for this, God has something for me to hear. And as he speaks to us, he has something for you. And here's the thing. I don't know what God wants to tell you this morning. I just know what he asked me to share with you. Now, he may speak to you through his spirit in some way that has nothing to do with what I talked about. But if you will just this morning say, hey, God, what do you want me to hear? What do you want me to do? That's all I ask of you this morning. And then leave it to the Lord to speak to you. All right. So here's the thing. Annalise uh, called me up last week and said, hey, can you speak at chapel next Tuesday? And the topic is repentance. Again, great. Repentance. Everyone loves to think about repentance. In fact, if we're being honest, when we think of the word repentance, we don't think of that in a positive light. Why is that? Well, here's the, here's the reality, right? Number one, it means I've done something wrong. Number two, it means I've got to admit it. And number three, it means there's probably going to be consequences, right? So we're like, nobody wants to deal with repentance. In fact, most of us we think of in repentance is I've got to go to someone and tell them, hey, I did this wrong, and we're afraid of the reaction. But I want to flip that upside down for you this morning. I want you to think about this. Number one, God already knows what you're coming to repent of. Okay, you're not surprising him when you come and repent. So you don't have to be afraid that you're going to shock God. And number two, sometimes we might be afraid of, of some rejection or even some abusive response, but with a loving God, and this is the pinnacle of everything we're going to talk about this morning, with a loving God, the response to repentance is always positive. We think of it as a negative, but the response is always positive. So what is repentance? Let me give you a, a start out with a little story. Um, how many of you guys struggled with what you're going to wear this morning? You're not going to raise your hand because it's 8 o'clock and it's chapel, right? But here's the reality. Sometimes, well, let's back up. If you're a guy, this is me, there are three things that are required for me to decide what I'm going to wear. Number one, what's the weather like, right? Is it raining? Is it hot? Is it cold? Am I wearing shorts? Am I putting on a jacket? That's number one. Number two is, is it clean? And half the time, the only reason I change is because I put something on and realize, oh, yeah, last time I wore that, I didn't wash it. There's a big fuego stain on the front, right? And number three is, did I wear it yesterday? All right, that, for guy, that's it, right? I don't want to show up with the same thing two days in a row, right? I want to make sure I'm not freezing, and I don't want to have a big stain on my shirt. That's it. And then we're good to go. My wife walk in and go like, like I, I preached in our service a couple weeks ago. She goes, what are you wearing tomorrow? I was like, I don't know. It's tomorrow. I, I haven't even, you know, I haven't made it to the closet yet. She'll, I'll get up in the morning. She'll say, what do you want for dinner? Like, I haven't had breakfast yet. I got two more meals to get there before I decide. My wife, on the other hand, Sunday mornings, this is what happens. I'm in getting ready. She's getting ready. She's in the closet. She's got an outfit on. What do you think? I'm like, looks great. I go around. She comes back and she has another outfit on. Well, what about this one? Also looks great. Then she comes in the third. Still looks great, right? That's always the answer, guys, in case you're wondering, right? But then we go to the shoes. 
right? She finally gets in. And then there's like 14 pairs. And I'm like, I don't understand shoes at all. Like the, the, the flats, the heels, the boots. I'm just like, I'm lost at this point. So I'm just with a glaze. Finally, she picks an outfit out. Awesome. We've made a decision. I leave. I head to church. She comes later. She walks into church. Guess what I see? A totally different outfit than any of the ones she tried on when I was at the house, right? Why? Because she kept changing her mind. I don't know why. I don't understand it. I just go along with it. But here, that's a silly illustration. But what is repentance? The actual definition of repentance is simply to change one's mind. But the question is not why, no, it's not if we change our mind. It is why we change our mind. Now, let me, let me draw that out a little bit more. Changing a mind changes the direction, okay? Changing a mind changes the direction. So when we're talking spiritually about repentance, we're going in one direction, we change our mind, and we make a 180-degree turn to go in another, okay? So if I'm heading this direction, I'm heading towards something. And when we deal with repentance, the first thing it says, I'm turning away from essentially some sin, right? I mean, that's what we talk about spiritually. When we talk about, I'm going to turn away from a sin, but I'm also turning back to something else. I want you to catch this. A lot of times the reason we fail in repentance and to maintain that repentance is this. There's some sin that we're struggling with and we go, I'm not going to do that again. Right? But we forget that I have to turn to something else. And that something else is God. Right? We're like, I'm not going to look at that. I'm just going to stand here with him back to it. But we never engage God on the other side of the process. Because God is the source of the strength and ability to stay away from that temptation. So temptation, changing my mind, which changes my direction from pursuing something I shouldn't to pursuing what is the best for me, which is God. So I want you to realize how deep, deeply embedded repentance is in Scripture. Okay, we can go to Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, they sin in the garden, right? God comes, he finds them, they confess it to him, God restores them, they, they repent of that sin. So Genesis 3, repentance begins in the Bible. You guys, I know you study Old Testament, right? So you have the nation of Israel all throughout the Old Testament. What do we see? The nation of Israel, they follow God, they worship him, they start worshiping idols, they drift away, God brings discipline, they confess, they repent, God restores. And then they repeat, right? It's like rinse. Repeat, rinse, repeat. It's just over and over. They continue to fall away. God continues to call them back. They repent. They come back to him. You go to the New Testament. Jesus comes. Lives a perfect life. Dies on the cross. Buried in the grave. Raised from the, uh, raised from the dead. And the disciples begin to go out. And in the beginning of Acts, chapter 2, and all through the book of Acts and into the epistles, we see the disciples calling men to Repent. So this concept of repentance, it starts in the garden, it goes through the Old Testament, it flows into the New Testament, and then if you go all the way to the book of Revelations, chapter 2, John writes, maybe you guys have studied this, there are seven churches, he writes seven letters or seven statements to these seven churches. They're little, literal churches, but they have application for us today. Five of those seven, John writes and says, there is something you need to repent of. There is something in the body of Christ that is drifted from what God wants. And you need to turn back. So the bottom line is repentance is part of our, our heritage. It's part of our calling. It's part of who we are as believers. And it is, in my opinion, the, the single most important thing we as a believer are responsible for in our faith. I want you to think about this process, okay? Here, here's, if you want to put uh, kind of the process or the pathway of repentance. It starts with truth, right? So first of all, if, if we're living life and we're living in sin, part of the reason or likely we're living in sin is because we're believing a lie, right? Satan's convinced us that this is okay. This is fun. This is not painful. This isn't causing any harm. Um, no one's going to know about it. There's not going to be any consequence. And at some point, truth comes into our life. In fact, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So all of a sudden, the truth comes to us from the word of God. Out of that truth, the spirit of God brings conviction. If you're a believer, the spirit of God dwells in you. And when God reveals truth, the spirit's going to go, hey, 
that truth you just got, what's that say about your life? He brings a conviction from the Spirit. That's, that conviction calls us to repent. So the Word of God brings truth. The Spirit of God brings conviction. Now I have a decision to make. And my decision is, do I respond to the conviction from the truth and repent and turn back to God or not? Right? Now, there are two reasons, I believe, that we typically will refuse to repent. One is shame. We believe God will never forgive us. We believe we've done, it's too bad. We're ashamed to, to, to reveal it. We don't want anyone to know. God couldn't love me. I've gone so far that there's no turning back, so I might as well just live in it. Or pride. It's not that big a deal. I'm okay. I'm a good Christian. I'm better than all these other people. It's, it's really not, and Satan will say, hey, you're okay. One of those two, both of those are a lie, right? So we have to come to the truth that God's given us through the conviction of the Spirit. And then we say, okay, God, you're right. I'm wrong. You already knew where I was at. All right? So we have truth, conviction, and repentance. But watch this. Here's the good news. When we come to a point of repentance, number four, the blood of Christ, the Son of God, brings forgiveness. Okay? Word of God brings truth. Spirit of God brings conviction. We repent. The Son of God brings forgiveness. And then watch this. We're restored to God the Father in restoration, in a right relationship. That's the path of repentance. That's what it looks like. That's where we're going. So I want you, before we dive into a, 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 a if we will, a storyline, biblically, of repentance, I want you to understand, repentance goes from this negative to this incredible, incredible positive of restoration to Christ. And I, I want you to think of this too. Repentance is more about God than it is about me. This is part of our problem in Christianity, right? We're generally focused on ourselves more than we are on God. Why is repentance necessary? Because there's a holy, loving God who's perfect, who says, I want you to experience what I have to offer. You can't do it on your own, but if you will come to me and repent, I will restore you. It's all about God, his holiness, and his love, and his desire for a relationship with us. So, you guys know this story. It's not new. You could probably quote it to me, but David and Bathsheba, right? You've, you've known it since, since preschool, right? David, he sees Bathsheba. He desires her. He calls her in. Uh, he commits adultery. He tries to cover it up. Everything goes wrong. It's a disaster. He's like, this isn't going to work. So I've got to go to plan B, which is actually worse than plan A, right? He has her husband murdered on the battlefield. I don't know if you guys realize this, but Uriah the Hittite, he was one of David's 30 mighty men. Like, he was one of David's most faithful, loyal soldiers. David's like, I got to cover this, this mess up, right? So he has Uriah murdered on the battlefield. It's all good now, right? That she becomes, she becomes his wife. She has a baby. Everything looks fine. He's covered up the sin. It's not really that big a deal. We just go on with life. And everything seemed fine at the end of 2 Samuel 11, right? Well, we know that's a, a, a horrendous, adultery is a horrendous sin, but even worse, murder, right? These, these are bad things. And yet David, at the end of the chapter, apparently had no desire to repent. He felt like all is good. Now, he probably thought, well, yeah, that was bad. Probably shouldn't have done that. But we move on. How do we know he was not repentant? Because in the next chapter, part two, and probably you guys know this. Most of you do. Some of you may not. This guy named Nathan shows up. Nathan was a prophet. He was actually a good friend of David's. In fact, later on, one of uh, David and Bathsheba's children was named Nathan. Nathan is a prophet. He comes to David. Now remember, David is the king of Israel. He has all power. He just had a guy killed for no reason except to protect himself. But God tells Nathan, Nathan, I want you to go to David and I want you to call him out. I don't know about you, but I'd be pretty intimidated, right? I'm supposed to go to the most powerful man in possibly the world, at least in this part of the world, and I'm going to tell him he's wrong. And what he did, he should repent of. And he's probably going to do the same thing he did to me that he just did to the last guy, right? So Nathan comes in, but he's faithful to the Lord. And he goes in and he tells David a story. He says, David, there was a poor man. He had one sheep, one little lamb. It was like a pet. They probably named it Fluffy. I don't know, all right? So he's got this pet lamb. It's like a family. It lives in the house. It eats from the table. They treat it like the pet, right? How many of you guys have pets? 
pets. I have a cat. I don't even like my cat. My cat doesn't like me. She showed up one day and it never left. You have one of those cats, right? In the middle of the night, it just goes bonkers. We have to kick it out, all right? But this was a loving pet. Then there's a rich guy. Man, he's got flocks and herds. He's got, I mean, hundreds, thousands, sheep everywhere. Super rich. He has a friend come over one day. He says, we have to cook a dinner for our friend. So what does he do? Goes out to the flock, finds his best sheep. No, he literally goes to the poor man, takes the sheep away, slaughters it, and feeds it to his friend. David is irate. He literally says, this man deserves death, and he should repay fourfold. He says, who is the man, Nathan? He basically is going to go find this guy, and he's going to punish him for what he does. And Nathan makes this statement. He says, David, you're the man. Ouch. Right? There's the truth. There's the conviction. And David has a decision to make in that moment. He could have said, who are you to come talk to me? Hauled him off, thrown him in prison, had him killed. Right? David had all power to, but you know what David did? In that moment, immediately he realized the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that he was wrong, and he repented of that sin. This is why David was called a man after God's own heart. Repentance was the key in David's life because here's a guy that committed adultery and murder and yet God brought the entire line of the kings of Israel and all the way to Jesus Christ through him because he repented before the Lord. When we repent, there's always a positive outcome. But I don't know if you know the third part of the story. It's Psalm 51. So if you've got a Bible, I want you to turn there. I want to take a few minutes and hang out in this chapter. we got about 10 minutes left. But I want to read it to you. Because Psalm 51 is David's actual response to God of repentance over his sin with Bathsheba and against Uriah. Okay? So Nathan comes. David confesses. He repents. He turns back to the Lord. He pursues him. And then this is what he says. We're going to break it down into five parts. Verses 1 and 2. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Here's the first sign of repentance is brokenness. Brokenness. David was absolutely and completely broken over his sin. He had hurt God. He had hurt Bathsheba, he had hurt Uriah, he had hurt his people, and he realized it, and he was broken for what he did. All right, next section, verses 3 through 6. For I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret places. Here's number two. Repentance requires confession. David confesses to God. First, he's broken. Secondly, he confesses. God, I know. I admit it. I was wrong. Now watch this. He says against you and you only have I sinned. Did David only sin against God? Yes or no? you're like, is that a trick question? I'm afraid to answer because he just said he did. No, he didn't. But here's what he's saying. The magnitude of his sin against God was so great because our sin is always ultimately and first and foremost against God. Obviously, he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. Okay, but what he's saying to God is, I understand that first and foremost, this is a sin against you. This is about me and you. And I violated the rights and the privileges and the honor you've given me to be a child of God and to be the king of this nation. And I'm recognizing that. And he confessed that sin before the Lord. Right? We got to own up. Okay, we got to come before God and say, I did it. Again, God already knows. You're not telling something he doesn't. He just wants you to come and admit it. All right? Third part, verses 7 through 12. This is my favorite part of the, of the chapter. Listen to what David says. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit 
to sustain me. So two things here. Number one, David's sin is eating him up, right? He has no joy. He has no peace. It says, restore the bones you've broken. Like he is living the consequence of sin. A lot of times we think, hey, no problem. Sin's fine. Sin is eating us up. Bitterness, deception, anger, shame, fear. All these things happen when we're clinging to sin. Like Satan's going, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. But we know deep down that this is destroying us from the inside out. So the first thing is David realized this sin was destroying him. But here's the third point is this. David sought restoration with God. He was broken, he confessed, and he sought a desire to be restored back to the right relationship with the Father. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence and do not take your spirit from me. What an incredible cry out to God to say, God, I want to be right with you again. Part four, verses 13 through 15. Then watch the response. This is the result of repentance. I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God of my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praises. There's two things that, that happen to David when he repents. The first is this, God, if you forgive me, if you cleanse me, if you restore me, I'm going to go out and I'm going to tell people who you are and what you've done for me, right? Because when God changes us and we realize the incredible gift he's given us to have a relationship with him, we want to share that with other people who don't know it. And two, he says, God, I'm going to worship you. My lips are going to praise you. I'm going to celebrate you. I'm going to constantly bring you glory because you are this great God who could have crushed me. God could have done to David what he did to Uriah. God had every right to judge David's sin. And yet, he offered him forgiveness and restoration. So David says, because of what you've done, because you offer restoration, I will share and proclaim who you are to others, and I will worship you as Lord and Savior. And then, verse 16 and 17, he sums it all up in a conclusion. He says this, You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Here's the bottom line this morning. There are two forms of repentance we face in life. The first is this, and we see it all through the book of Acts from the disciples. Every person must come to a point of repentance to begin a relationship with God. It's the only thing we're called to do. We can't earn our way to heaven. We can't work our way to heaven. We can't read enough Bible verses or go to Christian school or show up at church enough. The only thing we can do is respond to the gift of Jesus Christ in repentance. And if we're honest, look, we're in a Christian school, right? We all love Jesus or not. There's, there's somebody in this room, I'm sure of it. M maybe you've even walked the aisle. Maybe you've even told people you're a believer. But in your heart of hearts, you know you've never made a decision to truly repent and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You're never going to experience the joy and the peace that comes from walking with the God who created you to have a relationship with him until you turn 180 degrees and pursue him. But for most of us, Here's the second aspect of repentance. As a believer, we are going to fall into sin. Some of you right now, even as I'm talking, even this morning, you're going, I know the sin you're talking about. You know in, the, in your heart of hearts what it is you struggle with. Pride, lust, anger, jealousy, resentment. I don't know what it is, but God already knows. And maybe this morning he's saying, look, you've been clinging to this long enough in your pride or in your shame or in your fear or in your desire to just enjoy that sin. And he's calling you to turn 180 degrees and pursue him. And I just want to encourage you this morning, real simply. I know, look, this is a heavy topic, right? For Tuesday morning, eight o'clock. It is. But man, the, the blessings that come when we turn back to the Lord in repentance far outweigh anything this world has to offer. And so I simply want to encourage you this morning, if God stirred your heart, if truth was shared, you were convicted by the Spirit of God, and you're at that point of decision of going, do I repent or not? Understand what's, what's on the other side. Forgiveness 
and restoration is waiting from the Lord for you. If you will just say, God, I give it up. I lay it at your feet. I walk away. I repent of it. I confess it to you. I want to worship you. I want to praise you. And I want to restore a relationship with you. That is repentance. So remember this. Last thing and I'll pray. Repentance always results in a positive response from God. Always results in a positive. You do not have to fear repentance. It should be something we run to because God's not going to hit us when we confess. He's going to come and love us when we come to him in that. So if that's you this morning, in your heart, you can obviously you can make that step in your heart between you and God, but I'd also challenge you, if God's called you to repent of something, that there's someone in your life you share that with, a friend, a coach, a teacher, a parent, a mentor, because that will entrench that repentance in your heart and give you someone to help you walk in that in the days ahead. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this school. I thank you for every student in this room and for the teachers that uh, day in and day out speak your truth. God, I thank you for a place that uh, we can find a refuge from the, from the world. But even in a Christian school, Lord, we know that sin is here. We know that temptation is here. And we know that there are students that struggle. And so this morning, uh, for everyone in this room, I pray that we would just open our hearts and ask, God, what is the truth you have for us? And for any student that has felt the call to repent, God, just give them the, the comfort and the peace knowing that on the other side is forgiveness and restoration and help them to run to you this morning. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.